Dan kan ik haar weer betalen. Dan kan ik haar weer betalen. Dan kan ik haar weer betalen. In the ancient Hanseatic city of Kampen, there is a medieval ship that was resurrected from the mud. And in this episode, we go sailing on it. Join us for a truly once-in-a-lifetime experience. And this is Aladino. Our journey began a few years ago when this boat fell off a crane. After four years of rebuilding her, we named her Magic Carpet and we set sail to go around the world as slowly as possible. This season, we're sailing in the Netherlands. Join us as we explore the history and strange natural beauty of this seafaring nation. From the canals of Amsterdam to the pastoral islands of the Wattensee, welcome to Magic Carpet in the Netherlands. New episode every Friday. After our huge inland journey crossing Europe from south to north, we were beyond excited to start sailing again. However, we're not heading out sailing immediately because the place where we are right now is actually very interesting and we have to explore it before heading out. So where we are right now is Kampen. And if we were visiting in the medieval times and I were to ask you, what city do you know best from the Netherlands? You would probably answer Kampen instead of Amsterdam as you might today. Because back then, Kempen was actually the main city in the Netherlands. It was a huge hubbub of trade and of commerce and of production. And uh, they had a lot of maritime history here as well. And over the course of things, actually the landscape around Kempen changed, which ended up making it harder for ships to come and go. And slowly Amsterdam became the main port. But this apparently is one of the best preserved medieval areas in the Netherlands. It's got a lot of nautical history and it's got a few replica ships uh, that we want to go check out. So this is Kempen. Okay, just a quick history lesson. Kempen's location on the Isel River between the Zouder Sea, now called the Iselmeer, and the Rhine River made it a prime location for trade. And in the Middle Ages, it was one of the most prosperous cities in northwestern Europe. It was an important member of the Hanseatic League, which was a band of merchant guilds and market towns formed to protect the trading interests of its members. The Hanseatic cities dominated commercial activity in Northern Europe. Most of the trade was done with ancient wooden sailing ships, and we had already noticed some signs of this history when we sailed into Kempen. Now we wanted to head into town to find out more. In the heart of Kampen is a small harbor, filled with several small boats and one very large boat. Wow, it gets bigger and bigger as you approach. Yeah, it's pretty giant. Look actually. at all that black oak. I don't know if it has a treatment, but it I must know be tar. It, I know it's oak. Yeah. This very large boat stands out from the others for more than just its size. To the modern eye, its proportions appear to be skewed, the strange turret near the stern like something from a child's drawing, and the wooden planks used in construction are almost comically large. When you draw closer, the ship smells like tar, and it creaks at the dock like an old pirate ship in a black and white movie. This, we would soon find out, is the Kemper Koche. In the Middle Ages, when Kempen was a thriving Hanseatic trading city, it had a population of 6,000 people and 100 kochas. 
These huge flat-bottomed cargo ships were used for trade on the sea and rivers all around Northern Europe. They would venture as far as the Baltic, carrying mainly salt, grain, wood, herring fish, or cloth. This particular kocha was carefully constructed in 1994, and is an exact replica of a real kocha that was found preserved in the mud not far away. The materials and boat building techniques were kept as original as possible, and the result is impressive. Ship, it's, it towers above me. I don't know if the scale is properly shown in the video, but it's, it's massive, the size of each of these planks. Incredible. So we just were kind of studying the methods of the time, and this is a cool method of, I call it a bolt. Um, looks like a rod. Um, and then with a hole and they just they hammer this this piece into it to, to, to kind of lock it. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is pretty cool. The kocha and its lingering aroma of tar left a lasting impression on us as we continued our stroll throughout Kempen. That evening, as I walked around the docks and watched the sunset, I looked across the river at the kocha's mast in the distance. I wonder, I thought, what life would have been like for a kocha sailor, with no engines and certainly no grib files, loaded with cargo bound for lands which must have seemed impossibly far away. Northern Europe is not known for warm and welcoming weather, either. It would have been a tough life. And now here we were, with our ship only a fraction of the size, but with incomparable creature comforts. The Kocha sat calmly at the dock. The moon lit up the ever-darkening sky. Horses galloped freely in the tall grass by the riverbank. It felt like the sort of night where anything could happen, especially something wonderful and magical. Okay, so the most incredible thing just happened. We have already been so blown away with how lovely and nice the people in the Netherlands are, and this morning is just another prime example. So, uh, yesterday we met a German couple uh, on a Vinde, and we were talking to them, of course, because we have the same boat, kind of, they've got a different model. Anyway, uh, they're friends with a Dutch woman from Kampen. And she's very heavily involved in the maritime scene and apparently she watches our channel. And so this morning she came over to our boat and it was so lovely talking to her and she basically ended up telling us that she has lots of connections with the Kocha here and that they're doing a tour this afternoon and would we like to be on the guest list? And of course, you can imagine what our answer was. So here we are and we're about to actually go for a ride on the Kocha, which is amazing. And so we suddenly found ourselves standing on the deck of the Kemper Kocha as it pulled away from the dock. Now the ancient kochas quite obviously didn't have engines, and for several years after it was built, this one didn't either. However, an engine was added afterwards so that the kocha could maneuver by itself. Not traditional, no, but it does mean that the kocha can be used much more frequently. <laughs>
The Kaja is mainly a downwind boat, but it can apparently go as high as 70 degrees to the wind, which is actually quite an advanced angle considering it was designed in the Middle Ages. But right now, this was an easy downwind course with light winds, and we even had a chance to steer using the very unique tiller. So, Ella, do you know is that the biggest tiller you've ever steered with? Most definitely. And we, and we thought <laughs> that... the biggest I ever will. We thought that if we get a boat ma bigger oh, than Magikarp, it will need a wheel. With. How is it, how does it the responsiveness feel? Too much responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And it's moving to the right. <laughs> if you stand stand up here, yeah. you can see more. Better, yeah. Yeah. It's actually okay. still going. I have yeah. to steer In the against you a little see, bit. Don't see anything. Yeah. No, because I was looking the sail, but here you look more the, the, the yeah. channel. You look the direction, Yeah, eh? yeah more the direction. Uh, other ships, look behind sometimes. The most important is the... All hands on deck. It looks like you... <laughs> it looks like you. <laughs> you sail on the North Sea with... Waves from yeah. two, three meters, yeah. you need to put them with two or three people. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I imagine that. Now it's smooth sailing. Yeah. And downwind. Yeah. Wow, you're really steering with your whole body though when you do this. It does feel like a lot of responsibility because the tiller is just so big. <laughs> But steering is only one part of sailing a kocha. The other part was defense. Kochas are outfitted with turrets, just like on ancient castles, to protect themselves against pirates. Actually, one of the main goals of the Hanseatic League was to create a unified front against pirates, but ships still had to have their own defense systems. The Kocha is operated entirely by a team of passionate volunteers, who were extremely generous with their time and their knowledge. Aladino and I got an excellent tour of the ship, but our guide, understandably, didn't love the idea of having a camera in his face. Even Aladino is only just now warming up to that idea. So we did our best to summarize his teachings. I just had a little lesson about the construction of the vessel uh, because they did huge studies uh, before they built this replica, of course. And the planks, they are overlapped and they used nails from one side and then they bent them around and drove them again in. So it created kind of a U. And in between the planking to seal the ship and to have a watertight boat, they used moss moss from the trees. Um, I think later on they also used hemp, but before they didn't have this here, they used moss, which is pretty incredible. And then because when the moss swells, of course it becomes bigger and so that it wouldn't escape out of the planks, they used these um, centels, they're called. They're little metal plates, handmade, and they are stuck on top of the plank to kind of keep the moss inside and there are more than 10,000 on this ship. Of course they're covered with tar but you can see the centels right here and all over between this plank and that one because to keep the moss inside and covered with tar. But one of the most mind-blowing experiences for me was going below decks, and realizing just how tough life would have been for a sailor on these medieval ships. Okay, so we just got a little tour of the underbelly of the ship, and a little explanation of what would have actually been here back in the day, because some changes have been made, and apparently there was actually no deck originally. This whole thing would be filled with cargo, and then the crew would sleep on top of the cargo. So now in this version, of course, because they have guests on and everything, they have little luxuries like the fridge and they have induction cooking and they have 
actual bunks instead of sleeping on barrels. Imagine an open boat piled to the top with cargo. Crew would sleep on top of the cargo using only canvas sheets to fashion themselves some kind of tent between the barrels and the sacks. Imagine the icy cold spray of the North Sea, the cargo shifting uneasily, the rigging groaning, and your best creature comfort is some canvas and hopefully some warm woolen clothes. About 20 people would join the journey, and often some would be lost along the way. Alongside the captain and his crew, there would usually be the owner of the cargo on board as well. Merchants would almost always travel with their wares to ensure its safe delivery and to arrange for its sale in the next foreign port. Meals were usually beans, dried bacon, and beer. Sailors who left Kampen to go, perhaps, to the Baltic Sea never knew how long they'd be gone. That was the true definition of being at the mercy of the wind and the waves. Without the right conditions, ships could be waylaid for months at a time, and families waiting at home would wonder when, or even if, their loved ones would return. With expert skill, the captain guided us into the harbor, and there we were, still dazed from the experience. After thanking all the volunteers, we disembarked. Near the Koch's berth is a small museum, a workshop, and a ship's tavern. Every year except for this one, COVID of course, the Koch tours around Europe, again sailed by volunteers, stopping at various ports to enthrall guests and share some Northern European history. If you'd like to get involved with the Kocha and maybe even get a chance to go sailing, I'll leave all the details in the video description. But for now, it was time to end the day at the ship's tavern. So after the sail on the Kocha, of course, the correct thing to do is to go to the ship's tavern, which is where we are right now. And I, I mean, I'm just, I am constantly, constantly blown away at the friendliness and the openness and the kindness of the people here. I mean, all the people on the Kaha, they're all volunteers. They were so kind to us, explaining everything in English. Um, Even opening the museum for us. They opened the museum for us. We'll figure out how to give donations. Maybe I'll have to tell you in narration because I don't know at the moment. But if you guys are interested in nautical history and keeping it alive, I would highly suggest donating to these guys. I really want to see them having the support necessary to make the Kaja continue to live. So I'm just astounded at the patience it would have taken. I mean, I wonder if patience is a relative term, because to me it would seem like it would take a lot of patience, but to them there's no other option than to wait for the wind to be downwind. And you never know when you're coming home, and you never know when you'll get to where you're trying to get to, because you've just got to wait for the wind. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got so... I mean, it's, nowadays sailors talk about relying on the weather, and of course we do, certainly I mean, not to the degree that they did. Yeah, but still, 20% 20 20 of sailing is just checking the weather. Yeah. And you do it constantly. How thick were the oak planks? What did he say? Four to five centimeters. Four to five centimeters. Yeah, four to five centimeters. I mean, the whole boat is so solid. Mm -hmm. 40 tons, the boat, mm -hmm. and then they would load it up with another 40 to 60 tons. I mean, you always hear of how, you know, life was tough for the salty old sailor men's mm -hmm. men, men's I think, I think men it back in the day. on land because I prefer, I, I just like that adventure aspect, but yeah. 
I mean, I'm sure I don't know though, Aladino. You know, if you were literally sleeping on cargo, getting pummeled by the rain with no cover, what did you think you would, you did on land? You're well, digging you potatoes roof. all day. Yeah. yeah, but you could mm. sleep. It was super amazing. Yeah. I mean, with the means of the modern word world. I would even be down if you say now let's uh, build a coffer <laughs> and I want to sail around the world on a coffer and I would be down. So is this really going to be magic carpet 2.0? <laughs> a coffer? Yeah. Would you be down? Would you that be would patient? be hilarious. I don't think so, no. honestly. It was very cool but mm -hmm. my big takeaway was how difficult life was so I don't know if I want to sign up for that. <laughs> Thank you so much to Jerry, English pronunciation, or Carrie, something closer to the Dutch pronunciation, for organizing this incredible experience for us, and to all of the Kocha volunteers for the extremely warm welcome. Thank you to you for watching this video. Please do give us a thumbs up and subscribe to follow our journey around the Netherlands. An extra thank you to our patrons who make these episodes possible. If you'd like to support our productions and become a patron, you can do so for as little as $2 a month and get lots of behind-the-scenes bonuses like camera gear reviews, insights into our future plans, exciting stuff there, and real-time updates. Last but not least, an extra thank you to these folks for really going above and beyond to ensure the continuation of Magic Carpet, and we will see you all next Friday.